Uh, so next up, we have Ingo Weber uh, from Data61. It's a CSIRO initiative. So he's going to be talking about some of the research papers that he's been working on. So Ingo Weber, everyone. Uh, this design process. 
um, on how you go about architecting, how you can go about architecting uh, applications on blockchain. Also asking uh, yourself the question, should I be using blockchain at all for the thing that I want to build? Um, and it also goes into the details on a more general level um, about the different decisions you can make. Um, sorry. Um, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I'll, I'll just jump ahead a little bit to give you um, this overview. So this is one of the tables where we're looking at the different uh, uh, aspects of uh, systems um, or different uh, design alternatives. So, for example, if you want to use blockchain um, using a fully decentralized uh, public blockchain, uh, using partially decentralized uh, with some uh, um, um, central aspects or using fully centralized systems, and then looking at the different properties like the fundamental properties of blockchain versus cost, uh, performance, and how many failure points you have. Uh, so there are three tables like that uh, in the paper, um, and also a lot of other explanation. Um, uh, just going back here. Um, then uh, for quality analysis, also from a software architecture point of view, we looked at cost and um, um, and the performance simulation in particular. Uh, for model-driven uh, engineering, we have uh, two tools. One generates um, smart contracts for public registries um, from models. So you define the data model um, and you define some additional aspects and it generates all the smart contract code automatically uh, from these models. Uh, the other one is uh, about business processes. Um, generating smart contracts that implement business process models, uh, which is a really fast way of uh, getting some uh, development going on, on blockchain. So you define what the activities should be and then translate that into a smart contract. Um, <clears throat> Then we have uh, a tool which we call eThrive. So that's basically um, a more public version of Dropbox <coughs> where the meta metadata uh, of the files uh, rests on blockchain in a smart contract. And we can define who has right access to it. So if you're the owner of the file, only you can change uh, the file. But pretty much everybody who is on your blockchain has read access. Um, and uh, for the actual files so that can be quite big, uh, we're using IDFS in the back of the phone. Um, <clears throat> uh, um, then we go to the business processes. So um, just in some more detail, uh, here we can take this, this process model at design time, translate it into a smart contract, which is a template of other smart contracts. Right? So you have a process model that says whenever you have an order, here is uh, how this should be uh, processed. And then at runtime, we can create instances uh, from this model. And the way we do that is we have a factory contract. And from that factory contract, we create instance processes uh, at runtime. Uh, we have a trigger component here that uh, basically uh, translates um, web service calls uh, from your enterprise systems uh, into a smart uh, and into a blockchain transactions. Um, <clears throat> so that's a, um, in terms of the integration, uh, it shouldn't be a, a huge overhead, right? Because as in traditional enterprise integration, uh, you integrate people with other web services. Um, and uh, the trigger then basically takes part of interacting through the blockchain. Um, <clears throat> there are some nice properties, of course, that you get from that. So we can um, we can support escrow directly uh, out of the box. Uh, everybody who is on uh, the blockchain, everybody who is part of a particular business process can see where the process is at. So this is um, primarily useful for collaborative processes across organizations. Um, 
<coughs> and uh, you have transparency in terms of uh, and provenance, so you can go back. If the wrong thing was delivered at the end of the collaborative process, then you go, can go back and look at the messages when exactly they were sent and what the content was uh, to really establish um, <coughs> what was ordered uh, versus what was delivered later on. Um, and then I have some more uh, in-depth uh, slides of, uh, around that um, on the formal side. So um, I think I'm going a bit too slow, so I'll skip it a little bit. Um, so, right, so for the uh, cost comparison, um, we looked also with the lens of business process execution. Uh, we asked the question, how much more expensive is it to use blockchain over uh, a cloud service? And we used the um, Amazon Web Services uh, SWF, Simple Workflow uh, System, uh, versus Public Ethereum Blockchain. And of course, you know, if you don't uh, have to buy, if you don't have to pay the transaction fees on the public Ethereum because you have a private blockchain, um, that uh, that doesn't matter so much. But uh, the cost is also related to uh, basically the complexity of the calculation. Uh, so it's not only a cost question; it's also a throughput uh, question. Um, and we have to, um, with our cost models, you can basically estimate um, the the application overhead. Um, and uh, we ran some experiments um, where we had uh, 32 instances of a process executed on the public Ethereum blockchain, whereas there's 1,000 uh, on uh, Amazon SWF. Um, and uh, then we had another process where we had uh, 5,300 uh, process instances <coughs> Uh, and we didn't want to pay all the ether for, for running that experiment on the public blockchain. So we uh, ran that one on the private one. And uh, the result was uh, that uh, using public blockchain was about uh, two orders of magnitude more expensive uh, than SWF. Uh, so about 100 times. And that was when one ether was $11.30. <laughs> <laughs> It's slightly more expensive now. <laughs> um, so, and then it was uh, about 35 cents US uh, per process instance. Um, and uh, if you if you do need um, escrow, if you do have to pay commercial escrow services, uh, that quite quickly uh, is offset because commercial escrow services charge often between 0 0.8 and 3.5 percent or so. So back in that, uh, those days, uh, if you had a value of more than $10 uh, that you would put into escrow, it was already more cost effective to pay the transaction fee uh, on Ethereum. And it's kind of pointless to update these numbers now because <laughs> tomorrow the, the exchange rates will be different again. But the cost model that's behind it, uh, you can look at that and, and, and kind of buy it um, um, with uh, up-to-date numbers. Uh, one other thing that I want to uh, expand a little bit on, uh, we looked at um, the aspect of availability. So this is some, some of the empirical work that we're doing. Um, so availability is a system's readiness uh, for correct service, uh, according to uh, definition in the literature. Um, for blockchain, when you look at blockchain as a component, uh, the read availability is, is excellent, right? Uh, because you have uh, uh, so many nodes all around the world um, that can have, uh, you can have as many nodes as you want, more or less, that uh, hold the same uh, data that hold the replica. But what about the write availability for sending in transactions, for calling a function of the smart contract? Um, so that was uh, less clear. Um, so Ethereum. Um, for quite a lot of people, they, they will accept uh, 12 blocks of confirmation, and uh, that should take about three minutes. Uh, but when we looked at uh, the data we collected over three and a half months, um, then here you see the, the, the time in seconds 
And so three minutes would be about 180 seconds. And that was true for just under 40% uh, um, of uh, the transactions. So <coughs> um, basically the measurements did not confirm that it was as quick as it should be. Now, when you're building software, that's uh, something you kind of want to know. The other thing um, that you have to be aware of is, is this part, which is you don't get to 100% uh, very quickly. You get to 97% uh, of the transactions taking about twice as long uh, as the, the average or as the mean, uh, the, the medium. Um, but some of them take really a lot longer. So again, if you want to build a system, you have to, in a way, be able to cope with that, or your system has to be able to cope with that. Um, then uh, one other thing uh, that we looked at was um, in Ethereum, the block gas limit. So that gas limit is set uh, by minus what is true voting. So every time uh, you build a new block, uh, you can vote it to go up or to go down. Uh, and it is uh, the sum of gas of all transactions um, that is maximally allowed to be in a particular block. Um, so gas basically translates into complexity slash into number of uh, transactions. So you can have in one block with a given limit, you can have a lot of transactions with low complexity, or you can have even just one transaction with a very high complexity. And um, last year, there was a uh, distributed denial of service attack where the block gas limit dropped from uh, almost 5 million, 4.7 I think it was, dropped down to uh, 2 million uh, and half a million even. And so for quite a while it was at 2 million, uh, and for three days it was at half a million gas. Uh, if you don't know Ethereum, <coughs> The, those numbers won't mean anything to you uh, necessarily, but it's basically 10% of what it used to be. So the blocks have to be a lot lighter in that period. And so the question was then for us, who uh, will actually be affected by that? Um, so this graph is a little bit hard to read. Uh, <laughs> this is the gas use uh, times a thousand, so this is four million, this is two million, this is 500,000. So those were the two uh, limits. And then we looked at all the transactions that had happened on public Ethereum up until that point when they, uh, when they reduced the uh, gas limit. Uh, and this curve here is contract creations. The red one is function calls. And the green one is regular transactions. Pretty sorry about the resolution. <laughs> um, so as you can see, regular uh, transfers, uh, just one person transferring money to another person, um, uh, almost immediate, uh, almost all of these transactions um, are about 21,000 gas, so next to nothing relative to the uh, gas limits. For the function calls, and you can see um, they, some of them actually take a lot uh, more gas. And uh, for contract creation, uh, these are basically the heavyweights. Um, you can see that here, um, the curve intersects with this line at about 50%, 53 I think it was. Uh, so for three days, half of the contracts that were previously deployed on Ethereum would have not, they wouldn't have been possible to deploy these contracts anymore. Uh, then when it raised, uh, was raised to 2 million gas, and it was uh, 2 million gas uh, and below, I think, for about 2-3 months, 17% uh, of the transactions were still uh, excluded of the contract creation transactions. So this is a bit of a danger in, uh, in a public uh, blockchain um, that is uh, more or less uh, democratic. Um, remember, the miners can vote on where that line should be. And it's not under your control. And uh, the availability of the blockchain may, <clears throat> may decrease for your system because the network decides it has to react to a, a DDoS attack in a particular way. Um, but you know, other measures were taken since then. And, and um, I think 
think the block uh, gas coming was very stable uh, about three million afterwards. Um, right. Uh, then the um, last one I wanted to mention is uh, latency simulation. So we basically looked at uh, modeling um, a whole application that uses blockchain um, somewhere in the middle to communicate across uh, different nodes. And uh, we wanted to see if we could actually simulate the latency on the application level from measurements that we're taking for individual components, including the blockchain. Um, and uh, so basically, um, there are three different graphs here. Um, one is this, uh, what we got as a simulation result. The other one is the measured results. Uh, and you can see that they are similar. They're not perfect, but uh, usually we were within about 10% uh, of accuracy for the outliers and um, a lot more precise for the, the medians. So uh, traditional uh, software architecture methods of uh, performance simulation uh, actually seem to work um, if you have blockchain in the middle even though there's all this variance, uh, uh, these extreme differences uh, um, in delays. Um, okay, so I could talk, uh, talk on and on and on. I won't do that. <laughs> I'll finish here. Um, so if you're interested in our research, here's the reference. And the two blockchain reports are uh, here. And if you want to get in touch with me, uh, please drop me an email. Time for one question.